Welcome, everybody, um, or welcome back, I should say. Uh, I'm Karen Holweg, and on behalf of the CU Center for Sustainable Landscapes and Communities and Boulder's Open Space and Mountain Parks Department and the Four Mile Watershed Coalition and CU's Master of the Environment Program, we're all happy to have you back here today um, for the third of our three sessions for Take a Hike. Uh, to learn about fire and forest health in the Shanahan forest area. Um, we started back on August 20th. You've all had a couple of weeks to go out and take at least one hike uh, following this story map. And today we're going to do a post hike discussion and address your questions and uh, hopefully have a, a robust discussion. The purpose of this session is to provide you with opportunities to both share your observations and get answers to questions uh, from your hike and observations in the Shanahan Forest and to promote dialogue. And we also wanna use this as an opportunity to get your feedback since as you know, this is our first ever uh, take a hike session. The third, third in the series of the, this take a hike series. Um, so our gen agenda for the evening is to start to find out a little bit about how you did with the story map, how it worked for you, um, and then we want to go straight into the main feature of the evening, which is questions and observations and discussions with Chris Warner, um, and then we'll do a little bit of wrap up at the, the end. Um, So let's get started. We want to start first with the story map and find out how you did with the story map. So again, over there in the chat box, I want you to give us your number and use the, the prompt, my experience with the Shanahan story map was, if it was terrible, put in a one. If it was terrific, put in a 10. And uh, you can use all the numbers in between to indicate to us what number you think you'll give us for your experience with the story map, one to 10, with 10 being terrific, one being absolutely terrible. So just use the chat window to put. And then add a word or a phrase and tell us what you really thought about the story map. We haven't heard of anybody who had technical difficulties, but if you had technical problems while you were using the story map, if you would put in your email address, then we would try to uh, get back to you and find out uh, what your problems were, and that would help us to enhance our use of, of the story map technology. Okay, have all of you had a, a chance to put in a number and a a, uh, a word or a phrase about the story map. Chris, can you see those? I can't see the chat anymore because I'm, I'm seeing my screen instead. Yeah, I'm seeing them come through. Great, thanks. You can also save the chat, Karen, through it later. That's right, yep. Does it look like all the, the numbers and phrases are in there? Chris, have we gotten about a dozen or more? Yeah, I think so. I can, I can try to give a quick recap if, if you want me to try to yeah, do that. Yeah, tell, tell us what you see numbers wise. How'd we do? Um, I'd say we're probably averaging a 7.5 or eight. Great. <laughs> uh, it looks pretty good, yeah. Um, Definitely, definitely hearing some technical difficulties, um, some repetitiveness, which I can agree with. There, there was probably, uh, we probably hit on a number of themes a variety of times. Um, some, uh, some big, big uh, 
words and concepts and then maybe some other ones that were too simplistic. So um, that's always a trick with educational yep. programs is finding the, the middle ground. Um, yeah, otherwise, uh, thought it was a pretty um, creative way to do things, which is what we were going for. Um, yeah, I think in general, there were a number of fives in there. So um, it'd be interesting to hear kind of how, from a technical standpoint, people thought it went. Sounds like maybe there was some, some phone issues, which are beyond everybody's control. Um, right. There were some, uh, a few people had some good luck printing it out in advance, which was probably a good idea. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's probably the general, general themes. Great, thanks. And, and if any of you want to add um, an additional bit of information about your experience to help us improve the story map and the use of it, uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Tomorrow, Aaron is going to be sending an email to everybody uh, and give you some uh, place where you can more easily than in the chat write uh, something a little bit longer. So your feedback on that form would be very helpful if you uh, have any suggestions to give us in more detail. So thanks for, for that. And let's move on to the second item on our agenda, which is as you know, the main main deal, um, which is your questions and observations about the forest itself, about forest management, and about wildfire risk. And we want you to give us a number again. This time, uh, the number is about my experience observing and learning was one is terrible, 10 is terrific, and use any of those numbers in between. So please give us a second number. And then if you haven't already uploaded questions and photographs, which several of you have, um, and want to ask a question, you're welcome to type a question into the chat window as well, or an observation, or something that you wondered about. I'll give you a little bit of time to finish doing that. It looks like a couple of more people have joined. Uh, so if you've just joined, um, in the chat window, we're asking people to give us a number that describes your experience observing and learning as, as you hiked in the Shanahan Ponderosa Forest. One is terrible, 10 is terrific, and you can give us any number in between there. And while you're finishing up those uh, entries in the chat box, I'm going to go ahead and, and get us started uh, with Chris Warner uh, asking questions and um, getting his feedback on some things that um, Jason family put in the, the uh, Google space where we had you entering observations and questions. Um, they, the Thrasher family, um, were really impressed by the difference between stop one and stop three, as shown in this photograph. And uh, one question um, that someone else asked was, are there some species that depend on this type of forest that's in stop three, the more dense um, kind of forest that's shown on the right-hand side. 
Um, and what are, are there advantages to keeping it in our forest system? Um, so short answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, in general, we don't, we don't want to make anything, you know, the whole forest look the same. Um, and I think that's definitely kind of an ongoing theme is um, heterogeneity on the landscape is, is a good thing. Um, there are definitely species that appreciate and utilize the, the denser, um, uh, more treed kind of areas um, over others. Um, Abert squirrel is kind of an, an interesting example because they tend to like um, interlocking crowns. So basically kind of the, the tops of the trees where they can, they, they can off the ground and jump from tree to tree. Um, so Abert squirrels like a, a mix of densities. You know, they, they like the, the big open trees, but then they also like denser um, interlocking crowns. So that's, okay. that's Example, we have lots of examples of interior bird species that like a denser cover. Um, so yeah, having, having kind of a mix on the landscape is, is the goal. And, and like I said, I, we wouldn't ever want to treat every single inch, which you know probably isn't realistic for a variety of reasons, but um, creating kind of a patchwork on the landscape of of dense and open and um, meadows and shrublands and a little bit of diversity adds to the diversity for wildlife as well. Great, I, that thought didn't cross my mind uh, yeah. as I was hiking past seeing the difference. Uh, the Thrasher family noted the tremendous number of cones in that denser area and um, as well as the high density in the number of down limbs in that forest. Uh, what I'm wondering is when a fire goes through that forest, uh, based on my experience with cones in campfires, is, is the fire hotter in the, the kind of forest that was at, at stop three? Um, it certainly can be. Um, you know, one of the big things that we measure for fire and fire planning is the fuel load. So, and, and the fuels are broken down basically by diameter. So you have one hour, 10 hour, 100 hour, 1000 hour fuels. Um, and those will influence and impact how, how a fire burns. So um, like the picture on the left where basically it would be burning through a whole lot of real fine fuels, the one hour fuels. Um, and the grasses. Yeah, grasses and needles. It would move through there really quickly. Whereas um, this may be not the, the perfect example, but something like on the right where you have a fair amount of down material, you have um, down logs, down limbs, a lot more of those heavy fuels, um, you'll get a, a hotter fire. Um, and then you'll also get higher residence time. So basically the fire will sit in an area for a longer duration, which means, you know, you have, um, intense impact on the soils, which can have long, long-term impacts, um, impacts to, you know, the, the seed bed that might be in there, the, just the, the um, physical characteristics of the soils, um, a variety of things that can come along with just having a much hotter and longer duration burn in those areas. Interesting. Great. Um, I don't see any other, well, there was one other question that the Thrasher family had. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing this photo because it doesn't have anything to do with it. Well, <laughs> while I ask the Thrasher's other question, um, Nate, why don't you go to the, uh, the photographs and questions that people have posted? Um, so in our response sheet? Uh, in the Google, wherever it is. Yeah. There's a couple uh, here in the chat too that I can get that, to and already. Okay. Um, are there some that go along with what you were just talking about? Um, probably not directly. We'll, we'll get there. Okay. Let me, let me continue then with the Thrasher's other question, which had to do with places where they could see 
more obvious blackening and evidence of fire itself where you've probably where you've done prescribed burns more recently? So um, just being able to see evidence of it, is that? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, so um, this kind of goes along with some of the, the fuel stuff too. Um, a lot of the areas that you looked at on the tour were um, prescribed burns. So they were done kind of, uh, we more or less picked the day when they burned. Um, so we could kind of choose the, the conditions and the, the fuel moistures and that kind of thing. So they were actually fairly low intensity and they moved through really quickly. So um, in some of the areas you can see evidence of, of torching in the trees, like kind of the lower branches brown or blackening out. Um, but, you know, th those kind of short duration, quick moving fires don't leave a whole lot of long lasting. Okay. Um, if it were a hotter fire or um, we had a steeper slope, fire tends to work kind of like water, but in opposite, it tends to flow uphill quickly and intensely. Um, and you'll actually see, so like a slope that's burned, if you look on the uphill side of the tree, the fire will kind of eddy out behind the tree and leave what's called cat faces or cat scars on the uphill side. So you can actually see fire scars on trees that were burned. Um, so th those would be kind of the things to look for is um, branches that have limbed up, uh, some scarring. You can still see some blackened um, stems out there, but um, they, were, they were pretty low intensity fires. So in this area, we, there isn't a whole lot of sign remaining. Okay, uh, Nate? Yeah, um, I can go ahead and share the responses we got then. Good. Um, so some of the, here's some of the questions then. Um, that I don't know, Chris, if you just want to go through some of them at the top and then I can scroll um, as you need, it looks like about uh, three, three of the questions we'll need to scroll for at the bottom there, but. Okay. Okay, um, and I think we've already taken uh, this one, which has to do with the damage on the trees. Yeah, that second one. Um, somebody saw an Averts, which is awesome. Um, so is it, maybe they don't see them quite as often. Um, yeah, that, that certainly may be the case in some areas. Like I said, Averts have a pretty specific um, habitat um, requirement as far as kind of having those big um, old trees and a mix of, of size classes and diversity. So um, as that diversity is sort of changed across the landscape, um, that, that habitat has been impacted and probably decreased um, over time. So um, there are certainly areas that you see lots of them. Enchanted Mesa, um, uh, we were talking about Heil, some of those areas that still have a lot of those um, historic kind of uh, forest conditions really support a lot of, of Abert squirrels. And uh, for those of you who haven't heard yet, um, our next take a hike will be at Heil. So if you do that, you'll have a greater chance of seeing Abert squirrels too. Um, okay. I'm not seeing your whole screen there, Nate. So if you could scooch it over a little bit. Uh, so which part? I'm just not Which part's obstructed? The left hand side of it. I think we're down to the... Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. I think, yeah, there might have just been a little delay. It should be all of the, the last three questions now. Hopefully you're... Uh, the smart. next question is, what is, what is the blight that's on the willow on the north-facing meadow after the Douglas fir forest? This meadow is full of bee balm in the summer if that helps identify it. <laughs> and the meadow is just above the little 
creek drainage before you go up to the North Shanahan Trail? Yeah, I, I, can, I can picture the meadow, um, but I'm not sure what the blight is. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to get out and check that one. Um, I think that came from, is it Blythe? Is, is the woman who asked that question on the call? Do you want to unmute and, and describe what you saw that you're calling Blythe? Hi, it's me, Jay. Oh, good, Jay. Um, it's you, on the map, you come down through the Douglas fir forest and then there's this meadow and along the side of the trail, um, once upon a time was a really low growing shrub area where there were a lot of birds. It looked like a willow, it might have been a choke cherry, but all the leaves are gone and there are these black spongy things, gall, gall sort of things on mm. all of the branches. Hmm. Do you yeah. know if they're cankers too? Because I know there's a certain fungus um, that like infects willows and that causes like black cankers to grow. That's probably what it was, but it, it kind of has decimated that whole little uh, bunch of bushes there, which often had a lot of birds in them. So, okay. Yeah. I'll have to get out and check it. There's okay. A, there's a variety of, of bugs and crud that we get out there. So. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um. The next question is about donations for the, the program. And um, I, I'll address that at more length later on, but the, the donations are going to the CU Center for Sustainable Landscapes and Communities, which all the organizations who are participating in this program are a part of. It's a collective organization, and all of us uh, tap those resources to be able to sustain this kind of programming. So that's why they're, they're made out to the, not to CU in general, but to the CU Center for Sustainable Landscapes and Communities. Um, so the, the next, next one, yeah. The next so, item is interesting. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so just humbled by the amount of work required to maintain healthy forests. Um, yeah, it, it's it's definitely an undertaking. Um, I, I think one of the the key messages too is that it, um, you know, it's it's never done. You know, you, you, the the trees keep growing and. You get more trees every every couple of years. So, um, you know, once you've sort of restored an area, there's that ongoing maintenance that's going to take, you know, in, into perpetuity. Um, and a lot of that is the fact that you know these these forests are fire adapted and would historically have been maintained by regular intervals of fire. Um, and in most cases, when we're in the wildland urban interface, it's just not realistic to, to sort of rely on that anymore. So um, it, is, it is kind of a, an upfront cost, but then there's also the kind of the long-term maintenance that's, that's associated with it. So um, a piece of that is being strategic about where we spend our money and how we spend our money and, and how, uh, where do we get the, the most bang for our buck as far as um, restoration projects go on the landscape? There's another question in the chat that uh, somewhat goes along with that. So let me ask that next, Chris. Yeah. Um, it's a request to have you talk a little bit about the post-prescribed fire assessment of the effectiveness of the results of the prescribed fire. Um, what do you do in terms of looking at the burn after it's happened and what kind of ongoing monitor do you look for uh, to see what's happening post fire? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I th we have a variety of, of kind of ongoing monitoring um, projects and I think you saw some of the results in the in the walking tour. There was a stop, I think it was maybe three or four that 
talk sort of about the, the impacts of, of management on birds and understory vegetation and, and some of that stuff. Um, we have a variety of, of plant monitoring that goes on out there, um, both kind of in treatments and in control areas to measure um, what is the vegetation response. In the, in the last one, we talked about what, what is understory and what does that look like. So we have understory monitoring to, to chart kind of over time how our, our management is, is impacting um, the vegetation response. Um, we have similar monitoring as far as um, uh, native birds um, composition and, and density use. Um, we have bat monitors in a lot of our treatment areas that measure kind of bat response pre and post um, thinning and burning. Um, trying to think of what else. Um, those are some of the, the big ones, but it, it's definitely been, that's kind of one of the keys to our forest ecosystem management plan is, is what's called adaptive management. So, you know, putting something out there and doing the management and then tracking the impacts that we're having over time. And are we, are we meeting the goals and, and the objectives that we originally laid out with, with our management and um, having the, the positive uh, impacts that, that we want to see as we go, and and maybe we're we're finding out that we're not quite there yet. You know, uh, in the comments, a couple of people said they didn't they didn't notice a difference between the the thinned and unthinned areas. So, you know, maybe if if that's showing up in our monitoring that we're not having impacts on the understory or impacts positive impacts on the wildlife, that those may be areas that we go back to and and reassess or, or remeasure or, or even remanage as, as time goes on. And how frequently do you have to go back to an area that's had a prescribed burn, typically? Um, we're on kind of a eight to 10 year cycle in these lower montane areas. So um, like I said, the, the trees keep growing and, and depending on how productive a site is, um, it may take more, more frequent returns to kind of maintain those open conditions. It may take less frequent ones, and, and it kind of depends on the objectives for, for each area. Okay. Um, one more question in the, on the Google um, site, which is, what birds might we have seen was hard to see them in the late afternoon light. And I would say that some of them were so tiny and flitting around so busily, it was hard I, to <laughs> see them. Yeah. Um, I know. Oh, go ahead, Chris. I just uh, I know I saw a bunch of broad-tailed hummingbirds. I actually have a picture I took at, at exactly on Shanahan. Um, nice. Yeah, there's there's a wide variety, and I'm, I'm definitely not the... Uh, the bird guy to, to, to list them off, but um, maybe a, a good follow up is is we could provide a list of of um, ponderosa pine specific birds to look for the next time the nut hatches and um, some of those things that might be might be consistent for for the birders out there. There were some woodpeckers up there. Yeah, today. woodpeckers for sure. They, they were busy and they tend to be really busy right after the burns, um, yeah. just because of the insect activity that, that follows. Um, I'm trying to pull up pictures. Yeah. I was gonna scroll back to, um, there were a couple of questions um, so on stop five, the north facing slope on the Mesa Trail, the, the pine forest seems really dense. What are the plans for the management of this area? Um, that's a good question and that, that gets to a lot of the, the diversity that's out there. Um, as you, you sort of worked your way through one of the points that was in the, um, the virtual tour was the fact that kind of north facing slopes act differently than south facing slopes. Um, and and that, that kind of applies in a variety of things, both from the vegetation that you would expect to find, you know, it, it shifted from 
the south facing drier slope that was all dominated by ponderosa pine to a north facing slope that was dominated by kind of a mix of ponderosa and douglas fir. Um, that shift is, is really lent to the fact that you have a much higher, um, it, it's just wetter on the north facing slope. It, it holds snow for longer, it's, it's shadier, it, it, it's wetter. So um, historically those north facing slopes actually would have burned less frequently than some of those uh, more open areas. So you would, would have had kind of this, this patchwork of open forests versus more dense forests. Um, and once again, that, that sort of lends itself to more diversity from a, a vegetation standpoint, as well as a wildlife standpoint. You've got a whole variety of, of um, habitat types, depending on what slope you're on. So um, in, in most cases, you know, it's, it gets back to that landscape context, but in, in a lot of cases on the north facing slopes, we don't do a whole lot of management just because they would have historically been denser. Um, if, it's, if it's directly adjacent to homes or in a neighborhood, we might, we might address that differently, but, um, you know, we can, at a, at a larger scale, we can address those strategically by, you know, thinning around those areas or, or keeping the 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 south facing and the the flatter areas less dense and and maintaining some of those pockets of denser forest good um i want to shift to a couple of questions that that are a bit related to each other one person wanted you to talk a little bit about the fencing yeah and uh where there's fencing and why it's there um and then when you get done with that, um, we want to shift to a little bit about the grasses. So take fencing first. Okay, so yeah, fencing is a whole nother topic probably. It's, it's certainly um, maybe not directly forestry related, but um, kind of the bigger picture that we're addressing with the fencing in that area is to um, treat for tall oak grass, which is a non-native um, grass species. I'm sure as you were walking out there, you saw it and didn't even notice it. It's about, it's about four feet tall right now, and it's all beautiful and blonde. And um, as you're- It has you're, tassels on the top, right? Yeah, it's, it's tasseled at the top. If you, if you look at the NCAR um, property, it's, it's basically everything on the north side of the NCAR. Um, but it's, like I said, it's a non-native grass species that's really taken over in the Shanahan Ridge area. Um, and one of, the, one of the management techniques that we found that's the most effective for tall oak grass is grazing. Um, it's probably there because we've taken grazing out of the system and it's, it's gotten so well established. Um, kind of maybe to bring it back to what we're talking about, um, you know, as you look at it and you look at that four feet of grass and it's, it's fairly short lived, but it, it creates a real dense um, layer of duff on the ground. So it, it, it can have a huge impact on, on the fuel load and the amount of, of fuel that's out there. So um, the fencing is designed to use uh, grazing to address um, the tall oak grass and the, the highest densities of tall oak grass that we have out there. So, um, so the fencing's for the cow, right? The fence is to keep the cows in. Um, and it's actually a very short duration graze that we're, we're planning. Um, we've done, I don't, I don't know if folks have, have, uh, walked up. It's the, um, sound of music trail. It's, it's basically just to the, to the south of NCAR, but it, it's an area that we've been grazing for uh, eight to 10 years over the, the past um, couple of years. And, and it's basically been kind of a proof of concept. We've put cows in there for, like I said, a short duration, two to, two to four weeks in the spring, and they really hammer the tall oak grass. And it gives the native species um, the opportunity to kind of gain a foothold and, and hopefully replace the tall oak grass over time. So that's, that's the purpose of the, the infrastructure and the, the 
development of the fencing in that area. Thanks. So it will have direct impacts on, on fuel loads, but it's, uh, it's, it's a bigger picture kind of uh, forest health issue. Great. And then uh, the next question has to do with the, the tall grasses, uh, for instance, in the Shanahan Ranch area, which is just adjacent to this, mm -hmm. to the east of the uh, trail that we all entered on. Um, and the question is, is there, a, is there a fire mitigation plan for the tall grasses in that area? Um, no. Or, or for the tall grasses anywhere in the yeah, area yeah. Gra might. grasses are are definitely a trick because you you can't really go out in thin grasses. You know, it it, it sort of is what it is. So um, a lot of the the treatment, as far as from a kind of a fire standpoint, would be kind of an immediate reaction in those areas. Um, we would we would you know kind of respond with mowers and whips and tractors in the event of a wildfire. Um, you certainly can mow those areas on a regular basis, but the reality of of mowing the you know hundreds of miles of of grass um, boundary that we have around open space just isn't realistic. Um, and, and from a management standpoint, you if you regularly mow those areas, it can give the non-native species kind of a foothold and, and an advantage, and they can move in and take over. And then you've got both a, a fire issue and a weed issue. So we try to avoid doing a whole lot of mowing um, just because it's it's sort of a temporary fix and it's it's got more um, negative impacts than it can have positive impacts. So how do you know where the fire is going to burn? Do you use computer models, look at the conditions, use previous experience? How do you, what do you do and how do you tell when you're planning a fire where the fire is going to burn? Uh, yes, to all of those. <laughs> um, I, there's, there's much smarter people than me when it comes to fire stuff, so I, I'll just kind of scratch the surface. But um, as far as how we sort of decide where our treatments may be the most effective, um, it is kind of a, a combination of things. So, you know, some of the big influencing factors for fire are the fuels. So where do we have a buildup of, of something that's gonna burn? Um, topography is a big piece. So, you know, if it's a steeper slope, a fire will carry uphill a lot quicker. Um, so, and, and canyons tend to be funnels for fire. So just looking at kind of where the fuels and the topography, um, Kind of layout on the landscape is is an important piece um, and then kind of you know from a, a season to season standpoint it's certainly what are the fuel conditions what's you know how dry are things what's holding moisture what's not holding moisture um, what what level of fuel do we have you know are the did we have a real wet spring and do we have a whole lot of grass that that grew that that spring um, so it's it's just kind of accounting for all those factors that that um, may feed a fire and, and influence how a fire would burn and when you mention a lot of people who have more experience with fire than you do you might mention the number of different agencies and staff that are involved in doing the prescribed documents? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's um, a wide variety. Within Boulder County, we're, we're probably pretty fortunate given the, the level of resources, everything from the Sheriff's Department to um, the city actually has a wildland specific division within the fire department that um, is funded specifically to support wildland and prescribed um, fire on city lands. Um, and then all the variety of, of fire protection districts within the county. Um, 
So there's, there's you know, hundreds of years of, of fire experience within Boulder County. Um, and we really tap into those folks for um, our, our prescribed fire program specifically where, um, you know, we need to know what's gonna burn and how it's gonna burn and what's the best way to burn it and um, what's the best day to pick. So we get together with those folks and it's, it's a long process to develop, to develop a burn plan to say, you know, how can we do this safely? How can we do it without smoking out the neighbors um, and still meet our resource needs and, and resource goals? So um, it's, it's definitely a collaborative and an iterative process to say, you know, what's the best way to do this and what's the best way to, to get our, our, our needs met? So um, lots of people around the table. Um, now we have a, a question from somebody who wants you, you to step back and take a look at the system and mm -hmm. say, what have we seen so far as results as from the efforts to have prescribed fire and thinning? And can you give any examples to us of, of results based well, on your decades of work on this? Right. Yeah. So, so there's, there's kind of a variety of results. Have we, you know, I, I would go back to um, the presentation I made two weeks ago that had the kind of the goals of our forest ecosystem management plan. And they were, they were twofold, basically to maintain and improve our, our natural systems, our, our, our for, basically the forest function. Um, and then the other one is, is are we protecting kind of the, the resources and the community from, from wildfires. So on the first one, um, I, I think that goes back to our monitoring, uh, the monitoring question. Um, are we having kind of a positive impact on the vegetation and the wildlife? And um, a lot of that long-term monitoring is, is showing, showing that we're having a positive impact. We have, um, you know, treated areas have more diverse understory, higher native cover, um, higher native bird use and, and bird diversity. So, um, you know, as far as those kind of uh, forest functions go, um, I think we're, we're having a positive impact. From a fire standpoint, um, maybe thankfully we don't have a ton of examples to, to point to. Um, we, we've certainly had fires in the, in the backdrop and um, within the wildland urban interface. The, one of the most recent ones was the Sunshine Canyon fire um, that was, in, I wanna say 2017. Um, and that was certainly a, a positive story that um, an area that we, we did some thinning um, just to the east of the Centennial Trailhead, if everybody's familiar with that area. Um, we worked with the fire department um, to do some thinning on that hogback that's basically between the Knollwood, um, the Knollwood community or neighborhood or whatever it is up there in the wild, the, the open space. Um, and that was a fire that, you know, was, was a late night start, moved really quickly, was moving east toward town and the, the thinned area provided an opportunity for firefighters to get in there and, and create a buffer um, and really an area where the, the fire laid down and they were able to, to control it um, before it moved east into town. So that was maybe one example of, of kind of um, an area where we had a, a very obvious um, response. I think, um, like I said, there's probably other ones across the county that, that um, Stefan can speak to maybe in, in future presentations at Highland and Hall. Um, well, and that's one of the purposes for this, the thinning and prescribed burns in the Shanahan area, right? To have right. an area where there's a defensible space. Yeah, yeah, and that's, you know, that's certainly what we're going for. It hasn't, it hasn't been tested yet, and hopefully it's, it's never tested, but, <laughs> Um, you know, during the, the Flagstaff fire, it was, I was standing down at the, at the Cragmore access and the plan was if it, if it crested the, the peak of, of South Boulder and Bear Peak that um, we had talked about burning, burning off of the, the line that was 
right there behind the Craigmore houses. So, um, you know, you can, you can kind of imagine what that, what that could potentially look like, but, you know, knowing that we had areas on the landscape that had been burned and that had been treated, um, we felt pretty confident that, you know, it would, um, it would meet some of those objectives of, of at least slowing it down. Good. Thanks. Um, Vic has some questions and maybe Nate, if you could put up the uh, story map so we can get a zero in on the stops that he's talking about. Um, Vic says at, at stop two, I noticed some small ponderosas that had been left near the fence. Were they left on purpose? Let's see. So, yep. So stop two is right. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I, I specifically left those trees or we left those trees. Um, like they don't have names or anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, th that certainly adds to the kind of the diversity. I think um, one of the things we talked about at the la last presentation was the Kind of the goal of having a mix of size classes you know you don't want to you don't want to cut all the little trees and you don't want to just have big trees um, you want to have a diversity so so those little trees can develop and sustain the forest into the future so um, that was that was probably what was going on there was um, you know the prescription will basically say you know leave 10 percent of the small trees or 20 percent and um, where those happen on the landscape are sort of, that's where kind of the art of it comes into, into play. You know, you might have a patch of a hundred little trees and you might leave 10 of them. Um, so there, there, there probably wasn't a, a specific reason that those trees were left other than, you know, kind of to, to leave a diversity of, of um, structure in the area. And how do you, how do you enable some to survive and some not to survive when you do a prescribed burn? Um, that's a little trickier. So, you know, if we, if we know we're going to leave, if we, if we know we're going to burn an area, um, we might leave a little bit higher proportion of them. Um, uh, when you're thinning before the burn. Yeah, right. Okay. right. So to leave uh, lead up to that, you might have a higher proportion knowing that you're going to have, Lose them, yeah. In an area, so um, yeah. Once again, you you know it, it it's kind of a a shot in the dark as far as what you're going to get as uh, with the conditions. But um, you know, if we've planned it right and we have the the right conditions the day of the burn, then then we can pretty well expect um, what we're going to see as far as mortality in the trees. Good. Uh, and the last question uh, that we have here uh, from Vic as well that you've touched on before about doing additional thinning and the desire to keep a mosaic with some areas that are not thinned and some that are. But mm -hmm. Vic specifically wanted to know at stop four um, whether you're planning to do more thinning in that area. Um. Let's see, for, yeah, we probably don't have immediate, immediate plans for that area. Um, though that's probably one of those areas where we would kind of continue to monitor um, as far as kind of the, the tree density um, and possibly get back to it kind of from a maintenance standpoint to maintain some of the, um, a mix of, of open conditions. Um, there's definitely more work to be done in the Shanahan Ridge area. We're, we'll probably be up there again this fall um, to do some areas along the north fork of the Shanahan. Um, but yeah, like I, like I said, it's, it's never done and we'll, we'll probably be back to a number of these areas in the, in the future. Okay, great, thanks. And Nate, if you could take that down. Um, Thank you. Come on. 
I'd like to advance a slide. <laughs> which it's not doing. Let me try again. Oh, come on. I guess that's not going to work. Um, what we'd like to ask you to all do is uh, go back into the chat window. Here we go. And um, give Our number and this time if you'll give us a number again one to ten with ten being terrific one being terrible um, give us one more number to tell us overall given the the pre-hike zoom meeting the hike itself plus the post hike uh, session that we just had tonight in your opinion um, your overall number for this uh, take a hike experience? Is one not worth doing again or 10? Really terrific and de deserves a gold medal or any of them. And please put that in the chat window. And while you're doing that, I'd like to uh, thank all my colleagues who worked on this. And this goes back to the fact that the Center, CU Center for Sustainable Landscapes and Communities is a group that's made up of, of all sorts of other groups. Uh, Uh oh, did we lose Karen? I think we might have lost Karen. And it's, it includes on the like this and bring you more socially distance experience during the pandemic and, and well beyond. Um, we have been asking for donations of any size, uh, whatever size is right for you to enable us to sustain that work. And then as I mentioned before, later this month, we'll invite you to a take a hike uh, which the county parks and open space people will take the lead on. Uh, we'll go up to Heil Ranch, uh, which is the place where we mentioned there are more Abert squirrels and, and some different kinds of, of Ponderosa fire uh, forest, and also some different kinds of forest management uh, that the county has been doing up there. So I'm sure you'll all find that interesting. We'll send you an email later this month to invite you to that and hope that you'll please join us again. So uh, thanks again for participating in this session this evening. And, um, and if I can get my screen to, there we go. <laughs> to stop sharing. <laughs> we can get back to the squares. So thanks again for all of you participating tonight and uh, all your good questions. And, and thanks, Chris, again for, for all the answers and helping us learn more about the Ponderosa Forest and the management of it. Awesome.